Welcome to note set number eight where we'll talk about how to actually compute those Fourier series coefficients that we learned about in the last lecture. So um, the idea is, and I'm just going to give you the formula, we can prove it but we're not going to do it. So this is uh, for the exponential form. Uh, so to find those c sub k's that we want, um, so to get c sub k, we take x of t, we multiply it against the complex sinusoid whose frequency is k omega 0, so that k matches that k. We integrate over one complete period. Doesn't matter where we start. Start at any little t sub 0 and go capital T from there. Um, and then divide by the, the period and, and we've got it. Now some books um, show only for the case of t0 equal to 0, but it's sometimes handy to know that you can start anywhere as long as you stop a period away. Um, so that looks like a somewhat of a nasty integral, and it can be, but for some simple textbook examples it's really not that bad. So capital T is our fundamental period, um, which you can look at the x of t and pick that off. Omega sub 0 is the fundamental frequency. Once you know t, easy to find with this formula. Uh, t0, again, any time point that you wish. Uh, some are easier than others. And k goes over all the integers. Now it looks like you have to do this formula here for every value of k. It's an infinite number of integrals. Um, but we can actually often do it arbitrarily in terms of an arbitrary k, um, and then we get a nice so-called closed form result in terms of k. Then you just say c sub k is equal to some function of k, plug in your k values as needed. Um, so one note, uh, when k is equal to 0, we get uh, this exponential goes to 1 because e to the 0 is 1. Uh, so we get this simple result here, which basically just says c sub 0 is the average, the time average of the signal over one period. And we also, as we've mentioned, call c sub 0 the DC offset of the signal. So let's take a look at how this works for the sine cosine form. Again, I'm not going to prove these, I'm just going to state them explicitly. No surprise, for the complex exponential form, we smashed x against a complex exponential. For the sine cosine form, we smash x against a cosine to get the a terms, and smash it against a sine to get the b terms. Uh, again, we can integrate over any complete period. Just a caution, make sure you account for the twos there. Um, other than that, everything is pretty straightforward. Now these may look easier because you've got cosines and sines in there and somehow those just feel easier than those nasty, quote unquote, nasty complex exponentials. But really, I don't know about you, integrating exponentials is always easier, even when it's complex, um, than integrating sines and cosines. Uh, so again, all the same things as we saw before. Now, how do we find it for the amplitude phase form? Well, you might think that you multiply by a cosine uh, with a phase term, but no, nope, no such luck. Um, not very easy. So the um, easiest way is to convert from one of the other forms. Um, so I've just repeated those boxes here that show how to convert from the two other forms. Um, but we've seen those already. So let's not dwell on them. Uh, and in fact, we can convert from any one of these three free forms. Once we have the coefficients in one form, we can convert it into any of the other forms. I always tend to find the c sub k's. I'd like to integrate exponentials um, and then convert to the other forms if needed. Um, so as I said, why do I prefer these c sub k's? Um, I prefer them because um, you've only got one integral to do, and it's often easier to do because there's um, exponentials involved. When you do the sine cosine form, you've got a, a, a cosine integral and a sine integral to do. Um, so you've got two integrals to worry about. Okay, let's look at an example. Here's a nice uh, rectangular pulse train. Period is equal to 2. Our um, fundamental frequency, 2 pi over the period, 
uh, gives us pi radians per second, so that's our fundamental frequency. Again, these are textbook type values. Um, real world signals are going to have periods that are probably um, much, much smaller than a second, like milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, and things like that. Um, okay, so, whoa, this looks nasty, but it's really not that bad. Um, here's just the general form here. Uh, let's see how much animation I do here. Okay, back it up. Uh, we're, we get to choose our t sub 0, so we're going to choose to start here, so we're going to integrate from here to here. Notice that that um, gives us the first half of our integration interval um, we have to deal with, but the second half since we always have this x of t in there, the second half is going to go to zero, and that's what I'm showing here. So that goes away, and we're left with just this term. So there, and and over that interval, zero to one, x of t is just equal to one. So that first nasty looking thing now boils down to this. Now you may say, well, that still looks ugly, but hey, integrating an exponential, even if it's got a j up in the exponent, easy, easy, still follows that same simplest rule that you saw in Calc 1, um, one of the very first integration rules that you got. Um, so what ends up happening? The thing that is the x, uh, the, that multiplies t comes out in front down in the denominator. So, so there it is, that's, that's easy. And then the limits, we, in a, we evaluate 0 to 1. Um, now, you have to constantly constantly be watching when does this break down well when k is equal to 0 we're not allowed to use this form so we have to handle the k equal to 0 form separately um, and we'll see how to do that in just a bit so except for the k equal to uh, 0 term uh, we evaluate this at 1 and 0 so if you remember from your calculus uh, now we're evaluating t, so this part here can actually be pulled out in front. So there it is out there. Uh, and so we're just evaluating this thing at 1. So there it is evaluated at 1. And then evaluating that at 0. And so, um, so e to the 0 is 1. So now we've got that. And now, you know, we can pull out our calculators, blah, 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 fuss and fuss and fuss. But hey, let's just look at this. We've got a complex number whose angle is an integer multiple of pi. So it's either going to be um, over here or over here. You know, 1 pi, 3 pi, um, all the odd pi's are over here. All the even pi's, 2, 4, 6, 8, are over here. Um, and how long is it? Well, its magnitude is 1, so it's either going to be a 1 or a minus 1. Um, so when it's a 1, it cancels with this. So for all the even k, this term goes to 0. For all the odd k, I have minus 1, minus 1, which is minus 2. Doesn't get much easier than that. So for the even k, it's equal to 0. Uh, for the odd k, we get a, a, a negative 2, cancels with the 2. The negative sign comes out in front with the j, and there's what we got. So very, very quick and dirty and straightforward, not too hard. Ah, but that's for the not equal to zero case, so we have to handle the k equal to zero case separately. When we set k equal to zero, what we're doing, uh, we're still good down to here. And when we set k equal to zero, we get e to the minus j zero pi t. Well, that goes to one, so we're integrating one and so it's just finding the area of this rectangle, really. Um, and so if we do that, we get 1 half. Uh, so that's our DC level. Now, notice, pay attention here. DC level of a half. What is that DC level? It's the value that if you drew a horizontal line at that level, you'd have as much area above as below over one period. Um, and so it's kind of the level at which the signal averages out. Okay, good. So that's that. So here's what we found the exponential Fourier series to be. Written out, you know, kind of term by term. Here's the C sub 0 term, k equal to 1, 3, 
minus 1, minus 3. Notice there's no even terms, right? Because the c sub k are equal to 0 for even k. Um, OK, very nice. Now, um, we can convert those to the sine cosine form by following our formula here. Uh, the a sub 0 stays the same, so uh, or is the same as the c sub 0. Um, and then we just convert um, the, the c sub k. Notice that uh, we're taking the real part and the imaginary part. Well, this is purely imaginary, so for, uh, for k odd, uh, and f so for k odd, we just take that imaginary part. Um, the b sub k then uh, for k even is is zero, since there is no um, since the c sub k is equal to zero. But now let's look at the a k part. We're taking the real part. Uh, of either zero or something that's purely imaginary. So those are always zero. Um, so the only a that we have is a sub zero. All the other a's are equal to zero. So there are no, um, no cosine terms uh, in this, only sine terms. Uh, so we would write it out this way. Um, so this is a little harder to see. Um, this one's a little easier to see what's happening. Notice that the amplitude of successively higher frequencies is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You can see the same kind of thing up here. You just have to account for the fact that these things in front are giving both amplitude and phase combined into a single complex number. So that idea of decreasing amplitudes as you go to higher frequencies is a very common thing in practical signals. Um, so um, we found the exponential form to be that, as we just said on the previous page. And now um, to convert to the, uh, um, the uh, amplitude phase version, we would again follow these, these rules. And so following these rules, we, we get these results. Um, and we say theta, we don't really have to worry about the phase for um, coefficients that are either um, 0 or uh, we don't worry about a phase for the, um, for the DC term. It's just a constant. It has no phase. Um, so that's easy to show, and we end up getting something like that. And you'll notice that that is exactly um, the same as the previous. Now you might be saying, wait, the previous result had signs here, but notice we got minus pi's over 2. Um, you can convert a cosine into a sine uh, by subtracting off minus pi over 2. So cosine blah minus pi over 2 is sine of blah. So it is exactly the same. Now, that finishes that example. Let's look at some tricks here. Uh, this is exploiting ideas of symmetry. So the, I, the concept of even symmetry, I'm sure you saw this in a calc class um, at some point. Even symmetry means we take t equal to 0 and we flip it. So it's as if we fold this over. We fold this over as if we're folding a towel. Um, and if when we fold it, we end up getting exactly the same thing, right? This folds on top of this. This folds on top of this. This folds on top of this. Good. Um, we got it. Or in other words, if it's a perfect mirror image around here, uh, we say that that has even symmetry. So a signal that has even symmetry, uh, we can show that in the sine cosine form, the b, all the b sub k's are equal to 0. Because, I mean, look at this. This is kind of looking like a cosine thing, right? So we should only need cosines. We can kind of guess. We should only need cosines to build such a thing. And in fact, that's true. The b sub k's are for the sine terms. We don't need those sine terms. And equivalently, from this formulation, 
conversion from the sine cosine to the complex exponential form, we can show that um, the C sub k's will be perfectly real because these are all going to be zero and those are the imaginary parts. So the C sub k's are perfectly real valued. And similarly, we can then show that for the amplitude phase form, since they are perfectly real, the only way a complex number C sub k is restricted to be real is its angle is either over here or over here since this is the real line. So that's either plus or minus pi. So those are our restrictions. So once we see a function that is um, has even symmetry, uh, the sine cosine form may be the easier form to do. Um, but if you choose to do the exponential form, just keep in mind that it can be boiled down to purely real valued coefficients when you're all done. Uh, now odd symmetry, if you flip about t equal to zero, you get the negative. So this thing over here is the negative of that, this is the negative of that, this is the negative of that, etc., etc. Um, so that's how we recognize odd symmetry. And again, we see that that kind of looks like a sine wave. And so we conjecture that, hmm, maybe I only need sines to build that. And in fact, that is true. I only need sine components. Therefore, the coefficients for the cosines will be zero. Um, and then the impact is that the C sub k's are all imaginary, purely imaginary, because these terms go away and we're left with purely imaginary. And then if it's purely imaginary, it's living up here or down here, so the angle is going to be plus or minus pi over 2. Um, so um, that all makes complete sense, at least to me, hopefully to you. So here's an example, the same example that we looked at before, just um, verifying that what we saw or what we're asserting for our uh, symmetry is in fact true. Um, what we found before when we looked at this, we did see that the a sub k's were equal to zero, uh, just like uh, the theory predicts. And we saw that the c sub k's, which we found directly, were purely imaginary. Um, so, um, you know, if we recognize this odd, uh, this odd symmetry, um, yeah, yeah, to get the odd symmetry, you have to, um, you know, shift it down around the origin. That's where you get the positive and negative um, ideas from for the odd symmetry. Uh, and then uh, we would also get the uh, plus or minus pi over 2. So all those results that we got earlier could have been predicted once we know that it has odd symmetry. Now that's how we find these things analytically um, and sometimes we'll need to do that and you're expected to be able to do simple integrals like that by hand. Um, but we can also um, sometimes find these things numerically. And that may be the case when we don't have an equation for our periodic signal, but we've got um, uh, you know, some shape that we don't have an equation for, and maybe we only have um, some samples, and we want to compute this integral numerically. Um, so if we remember that um, what we're trying to do, and I'm illustrating here for C sub zero, is we're trying to find the area under a curve. Now for C sub 0 it's the given curve. When we want C sub 1 and C sub 2 we have to multiply the curve by um, the complex exponential or if we're doing the a's and b's we have to multiply by the sines and cosines. Um, and so then that's the thing that we're finding the area under. But nonetheless, uh, we'll illustrate the idea here for finding C sub zero. The ideas will be the same for the others. We just have to remember to multiply by the appropriate sinusoidal thing. So if there's a bunch of samples, and maybe we only have this, this thing defined in terms of samples, um, and we don't have a function, we just have numerical values, uh, we can approximate this integral by just finding the areas of these trapezoids and then adding up all these trapezoidal um, areas. Um, so, you know, you can work out 
what the formula is for finding the area of a trapezoid and I, I you know I'm showing that area here um, for, for this particular trapezoid here but um, and you can do this by hand but that's not the point of this um, the point is that MATLAB has a command called trap Z um, that does just this and so if we want to evaluate this thing and here we won't be able to do it in terms of an arbitrary k. We'll have to do it for a, a series of k values, as we'll see in, in a little bit. But this is the form that we would use. Now, I'm trying to point out here that we need to use the dot star. This dot star here um, multiplies one vector times another vector element by element and that's very important here that's the effect of multiplying one function times another function so that 1 over t gets captured out there the x of t gets captured the samples of x of t go into this vector um, the exponential goes in here and it'll be evaluated at specific points in time same points in time that those values are evaluated at and then um, trapezoid uh, function in MATLAB assumes unit spacing so we have to uh, multiply by our TS we can sort of think of that as playing the role of the DT so um, as I said X is the vector that holds the signal samples uh, spaced T seconds apart T holds the time values spaced T seconds apart capital T is the period of the signal W0 can't do an omega um, in MATLAB is the fundamental frequency in radians per second. So here's an example. Suppose we have a um, kind of a ramp over one period. So I'm only showing one period. We would have this thing continuing on like this. Uh, that would be the subsequent periods of this thing. Um, but I'm only showing one period because that's all we have to uh, work with and I'm showing uh, specific values um, and so here is how we would do this on the command line um, you know, I'm just showing that we can do it on the command line but it's easier to put all these things into a script an M file uh, save it so we set our period to be equal to 4 we then compute our omega sub 0 for that given T value we then are going to specify how many terms we're going to compute what's the largest K value that we're going to go up to and in this case we're going to go from um, C sub minus 10 up to C sub plus 10 and that's that's set by this this line T sub S is our our um, sample spacing uh, we're choosing 0.05 we'll talk about um, how to choose that in, in a little while and then we create a vector of, t of time samples from 0 up to T um, spaced T sub s apart and uh, then for our specific ramp this is the equation so in this case we have an equation for it so we can compute it by equation uh, but in general we might just have some numerical values that we're going to put in there uh, and then this applies the trapezoidal uh, command repeatedly for um, all these different values of K starting from minus 10 all the way up to plus 10 so when we're done running that loop we've got um, uh, actually 21 different C sub K's from C sub minus 10 up to C to sub plus 10 uh, so how do we choose our sampling interval and how do we decide how many terms to compute um, and these two issues are related to each other um, and we'll address those so choosing the sampling interval and remember we're doing this um, in a computer so we have to worry about aliasing um, we want to make sure that when we're sampling this sinusoid and yes that is a sinusoid that we are not aliasing so we have to decide what is the highest frequency that we're going to look at and so our highest frequency is KF0 and so we need to make sure our sampling frequency is greater than double that well we don't know what K needs to be yet but we'll get to that 
So this is that sampling issue where we need to sample fast enough to avoid aliasing. So if we want to go up to 10, we know what our F0 is. We can find that from our omega 0. So F0 is just 1 over T. That tells us what we need for our sampling rate. Um, so let's stick with that K equal to 10 for the time being. So here we've added a conversion into F0. Um, and then we set our Fs to be equal to 4 times that, not just 2 times that, but we're um, going twice the minimum value just because uh, it will ensure that we've satisfied that. Um, you know, you can play around with that and see what it, uh, effect. Uh, and then once we have Fs, we convert it into T sub S. Um, and so if you look at the numbers here, we end up using a sampling interval of 0.1 rather than the 0.05 that we used previously. So it turns out that that 0.05 was even uh, closer than, than we needed. And, and we're being excessive here with the 4. So everything else is the same as before. Now, the issue remains, what is the largest value of k? We've been going up to 10. Um, so we'll address that next, but also in the next set of notes. We'll take a look at that. So once we have these C sub k's, what do we do with them? What do they tell us? Well, one thing we can do to just kind of check to see that we've got it right is to actually form this partial sum, compute that partial sum, add together these complex exponentials with the computed numbers out in front, uh, and verify that it looks like the thing that we started with. Um, and we can just keep doing this for different values of capital K to see um, when we have enough to make it look like the right, you know, reasonably close to um, what we wanted. So here um, we're going to um, uh, just, uh, you know, compute this approximation. Um, and we're assuming that we've got these things from before and that they are all appropriate. Um, we're just going to start off filling a vector with zeros just as a kind of starting point and then just keep adding terms. So we just imagine that we're going to just sequentially each time through this loop add a term but the zero vector starts as kind of our starter dough. Um, we start with the zero and then we're going to add the first term to the zero. It's just a, a, a common trick in programming. So here we are taking uh, the existing approximation which starts off as zero and the first time through the loop we're adding the first term. Uh, in fact really we're starting with k equal to minus 10. Um, now this indexing here you have to keep in mind that MATLAB can't index with negatives and zeros. So this adding k plus 1 makes it so that when we put in a minus k uh, we're starting at the first element in the vector. So one of the hard parts of dealing with MATLAB is that our math indexes negatively and positively, but MATLAB physically indexes, it's the first element, it's the second element, it's the third element. Um, so as we go through this loop, we're just adding in an additional term each time through. Now when we get to the end, we should just be done, but the last thing we do is we take the real part of this our theory says that all the imaginary parts should cancel out, but um, there are round-off issues. And so that, um, to make sure that those round-off issues don't creep up on us, um, we just take the real part. We know it has to be real. That's what our theory says. Um, so with, um, I believe this was with k equal to 10, and um, we end up getting the red as our approximate signal and you can see that um, it's not exact there are some errors um, so how do we address those errors well we can see that as we go to higher and higher so the the red one um, shows um, adding terms from minus 10 to 10 the green one shows minus 100 to 100 so um, in some sense, the green one is a better approximation, but we still see that we've got some of this ringing um, error at the ends. And this happens when we have a function that has discontinuities. Uh, remember, this, this 
the true function then discontinuously plunges back down to here to start. So anytime we have a function that is discontinuous, uh, so in other words, the value at the end of the period is different than the value at the beginning of the next period, um, we have this um, so-called Gibbs phenomenon where we'll have this ringing, and that ringing stays there no matter how big um, you make your, your partial sums. Um, but you can see that um, if you keep making them bigger and bigger, at least the ringing gets pushed farther and farther away. Um, so the partial answer to how many terms do we have to include, enough to make it look reasonably close to the actual signal. Um, and so we'll talk about this some more in the next um, set of notes. And so that's the end of this video. Thanks.